Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We have a lot to cover today, from SpaceX making huge strides with Starship development as always, and they recently shared some new insane views of the booster catch from Flight 7. We also saw plenty of Falcon 9 and Chinese launches, as well as the world's first audio recording of a meteorite crash. All of this and so much more, so settle back and enjoy. Things have been a bit quieter down at Starbase following the craziness of Starship's seventh flight test, which while was a bit of a disappointment given the catastrophic loss of Ship 33, it was still an amazing sight to see with the successful super heavy catch of Booster 14. SpaceX shared some new views of this over the week, including this one from on board the vehicle, showing just how fast these things come down. It's a pretty precarious watch. I especially love this shot here, showing the boost catch from third person, not just because of the insane visuals, but the sound is really what makes it. Anyway, what makes it kind of scary to watch booster catches is the potential consequences of a failed catch. The booster probably wouldn't destroy the tower, but it could potentially do serious damage to the chopsticks and pad. And if something like that happened, then SpaceX wouldn't be able to do any more launches until repairs were completed. But this isn't going to be the case for much longer. An upside to needing to do a mishap investigation into Flight 7 means that ground crews have lots of time to continue working on Orbital Pad B, which includes specking out the tower with chopstick catch arms. This was the main focus of the works last week, starting on Monday with the delivery of the catch arms to the launch complex. From there, they were lifted up and fitted to the carriage, which is the structure that carries them up and down the tower on this red fitting rig here. First the right hand chopstick, then the left hand chopstick. One thing you might notice here is that these chopsticks are a little bit shorter than the ones on Tower A. Given that Super Heavy has proven to be able to land within centimetre accuracy at this point, SpaceX probably felt that there really wasn't a need for the arms to be so long. At the end of the day, the booster does need to land fairly close to the tower and not all the way at the end of the arm since we don't want it pulling the tower over. As mentioned, the carriage will move the chopsticks up and down the tower, and it does this by riding on skates, which you can see being fitted here, they're those black parts sitting on the rail-like protrusions of the tower. The orbital launch mount for Pad B is also looking very close to being done. Remember, it's a different kind of launch mount to Pad A's. It'll feature a more traditional style flame trench and will be rectangular in shape. It's more akin to the ship static fire stand at Massey's, which also features a flame trench. The Starship that's expected to fly on Flight Test 8 will be Ship 34, the second ever Block 2 ship, which recently completed cryotesting at Massey's. It was returned to the production site for pre-static fire checkouts, and it may undergo a few upgrades to help ensure it doesn't meet the same fate as Ship 33, including adding fire suppression systems to the engine section and possibly increasing its vent area as well, as the leading theory for the cause of Ship 33's breakup was a leak that exceeded the capacity of the ship's vents. There it is, re-entering Mega Bay 2, courtesy of NASA Spaceflight, where all of this will take place. SpaceX continued to grow their Starlink constellation over the week, with three Falcon 9 launches in total. The first took place on Tuesday from Kennedy 39A, carrying 21 Starlink satellites and two Star Shield satellites, which are the military version of Starlink developed by SpaceX and Northrop Grumman. No public footage of this launch was shared online, unfortunately, so for that bit, I was just showing footage of the launch that happened about 10 hours later. Another Falcon 9 launched from Vandenberg, carrying 27 Starlink satellites to orbit, and then we saw another from Vandenberg on Friday, this time with only 23 satellites on board. All three Falcon 9 first stage boosters made successful landings on the drone ships, with Tuesdays being extra special, as this was the 400th Falcon landing to date. Now, check out this ring doorbell clip.
What you just saw was a meteor impact, accompanied by what is believed to be the very first audio recording of a meteorite crash, and it's also the only known meteorite fall in Prince Edward Island, Canada. This was originally recorded last July, so not last week, but it's just started being circulated in the news now, so here it is for you in case it's news to you. It's been officially named the Charlottetown Meteorite. Up on the Chinese space station, the crew of Shenzhou-19 completed their second extravehicular activity on Monday. Taikonauts Song Lingdong and Sai Shuju conducted an eight and a half hour spacewalk, completing several tasks, including the installation of space debris protection devices and conducting an extravehicular inspection. On board the station's Tianhu core module, Taikonaut Wan Hao Tzu assisted the spacewalk by operating the station's robotic arm. China was also no slouch with rocket launches last week. We saw three in total. They began on Monday with the launch of Galactic Energy's Ceres-1 rocket, which carried four meteorology satellites and one Earth observation satellite to low Earth orbit from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. Thursday saw two launches from China, the first being a Long March 6A that lifted off from the Taiyuan Launch Center, carrying 18 communication satellites that comprised the fourth delivery of satellites to the Thousand Suns mega constellation, which when completed will be over 15,000 satellites strong and will be China's answer to SpaceX's Starlink, aiming to create a system of worldwide internet coverage. Thursday's other launch was a Long March 3B, which launched from Xichang, carrying a communication technology test satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. The first stage of the Long March 3B was seen crashing down scary close to residential areas. While you can't see it in this CCTV footage, you could definitely tell it was close. China really needs to do better here. They are taking small steps. For example, we saw a Long March 2D fitted with grid fins on its first stage to control its impact area back on the 17th of January, but things are clearly not moving fast enough. This really isn't acceptable. NASA hopes to launch their polarimeter to unify the corona and heliosphere, or punch mission, aboard a Falcon 9 late next month. The mission will consist of four microsatellites, which recently arrived at Astrotech Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. NASA was kind enough to share some footage of both the delivery of these satellites and footage recorded in the clean room last Tuesday. The punch mission aims to figure out how small-scale events like microscale turbulence and global-scale structures like massive solar wind flows interact to connect the outer layer of the sun, the corona, with the vast space influenced by the sun, the heliosphere. Essentially, it's about understanding how the sun's atmosphere and its effects on space are all linked. If you enjoyed this video, then I make space news content every Monday and Kerbal Space Program videos every Saturday. My last Kerbal outing took us to Gilly with a single stage to orbit on a daring rescue mission to save Bob Kerman. This was a really fun one, all Blunderbirds missions are in my opinion, so hey, if you haven't seen it yet, then click on that card on screen to check it out. Also, please consider supporting the show by joining my Patreon like the great folk on the right did, or join my YouTube member program, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for watching today's episode of Space This Week, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all next time.